In April of 2015, I had a show of altered books at the Sonoma Community Center in Gallery 212. Etiquette and Modern Home Culture I found this book published in 1888 at the Sonoma Valley Library sale. The treatment of the cover was inspired by my thoughts of 19th century etiquette and the embroidery and daintiness of the period. I'd been watching the TV series Deadwood, where one of the main characters is addicted to laudanum, the opiate of choice for ladies at the time. The inside conceals her bottle in a diorama made from the illustrations in the book. Crochet lace gloves purchased many years before complete the piece. The Joy of Cooking Apron when I found The Joy of Cooking by Irma Rombauer at the Recycling Center, it triggered fond memories of cooking with my sisters when I was young. Although we weren't much for aprons in those days, I decided to make a sculpture in homage to the happy hours using that all-purpose cookbook. First, I found some stiff craft fabric that, when heated, released glue on both sides. Cutting and pasting the recipes, drawing and he drawings and headings from The Joy was a delight. Then I ironed fabric on the back, sewing the rickrack and buttons on the finished piece. Akaki's Overcoat The overcoat is made from sewn paper. The text from the short story was first sewn on the pieces of the coat. When I sewed ribbons of audio tape onto the collar to form a thick, fur-like covering. Sewing it all together was reinforced by glue. Poor Akaki. In the short story, he is a very impoverished clerk, used to copying documents all day with nothing else in his life. But when he realizes he needs a new overcoat, his life changes for the better. He and his tailor concoct a special garment. Because of his new coat, Akaki is asked to, to a party for the first time in his life. Alas, on his way home, robbers set upon him and take his new coat. He dies of pneumonia, but not in vain. His ghost comes back to haunt those who did not help him taking their overcoat, overcoats in revenge. This folk tale had a powerful effect on other Russian writers. Dostoevsky said of this story, we all came out of Gogol's overcoat, and I have used a cassette tape of Dostoevsky's to make the collar of this sculpture. They do not move. The sculptor Albert Giacometti worked with Samuel Beckett on a tree for one of the productions of Waiting for Godot. I've always admired Giacometti's sculpture and decided to make a rendition of a stage set for the play. Waiting for Godot is funny, harrowing, and profound. The two main characters are waiting interminably for someone who never comes. The last lines of the play read, Vladimir, well, shall we go? Estrakhan, yes, let's go. Stage directions, they do not move. Cinderella's Dainty Shoe. I grew up with Walt Disney movies, and being the youngest of three sisters, felt a keen association with Cinderella. As I got older and transferred my love of the story to real life, I became a shoe lover. What woman hasn't tried to squeeze her foot into a shoe that is too tight or too small, simply because she loves it? We torture ourselves for love of shoes, whether it's foot binding in China or tottering around, tottering around on super heels. It must be love. Memoirs of a Geisha. I ordered two copies of the audio cassette tapes of Golden's Memoirs of a Geisha from the internet. Knitting straight pieces on size six needles, I copied the long, thin, classic kimono proportions. The black bottom border was from a homemade tape of Dire Straits, the rock and roll band. Using pages from the paperback copy of the novel, I cut paper pentagons, colored them with watercolor, and then used an origami folding te te technique to make plum blossoms. I attached them to the garment with yellow embroidery floss. Told in the first person, Memoirs of a Geisha tells the rags to riches story of a poor Japanese girl sold into the life of a geisha in 1929. As a nine-year-old girl with unusual blue-gray eyes, she's taken from her home and sold into slavery to a renowned geisha house. Very important to the values of the society is the kimono, the sumptuous wrapper that conceals the body of the geisha and further enriches her value. Daisy's Dress Knitted from versions of The Great Gatsby, brown and black, this outfit has a separate skirt made from fringed pieces of the text and aluminum foil. 
The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald is a classic that I've read many times. Daisy Buchanan, the heroine of the novel, is a rich, bored lady who once loved Jay Gatsby. She's a flapper, dressed to the nines, used to giving parties and being feted. Daisy is at once attractive and free, snobbish and trapped in her life. I picture Daisy dancing and drinking in this outfit, not caring whether she ruins it or not. Julian Sorel's Game of Chess I made the paper chess figures by covering punch-out ones from a book called Paper Chess with the text from the novel by Stendhal, The Red and the Black, covering the pieces. The text also covers a cardboard box. The lid forms the chessboard with appropriately red and black squares. Inside the box are slots for the pieces so that each stays in its own separate place. In Stendhal's The Red and the Black, a poor but ambitious boy named Julian Sorel tries to climb the social ladder in post-Neopolyonic France. Julian encounters a doomed count at a party who, because he would not cut off the heads of three people, was being hunted as an enemy of the king. He informs Julian that life is a game of chess, but Julian informs him that if he has a chance, he will play the game and win. My Pretty Butterflies Long before I knew about the horror of abduction of young women and read about the real-life experiences of Polly Kloss and Amanda Berry, I read Fowles' book, The Collector. It is told in several parts, the first from the abductor's point of view, the next from the victim's. It's one of the scariest books I've ever read. The abductor protagonist is the butterfly collector. Before he decides to kidnap his victim, a young woman named Miranda. It's a loner who falls in love with Miranda from afar. He imprisons her in a cellar, hoping she will fall in love with him. Not only is she horrified, she tries to escape and attempts to kill him. She fails and eventually dies in captivity, after which the abductor vows to capture another victim. I remembered seeing my grandfather's butterfly collection when I was quite little. He even showed me how he chloroformed the specimens and pinned them to stiff paper to be displayed in a glass-topped box. I didn't like to see the butterflies flutter in their death throes, but politely suppressed my uncomfortable feelings. The Leviathan I've been on whale-watching boats and have marveled at the sight and size of these animals. On those trips, we were always cautioned to watch for the tail of the whale, called its flukes. When a whale dives below the water, it is called fluking. This sight occurred to me when I made this piece. I used paper clay to make the tail and then covered it with words of criticism about the content of Moby Dick. Having been a graduate student in English literature, I am well versed in the symbolic meaning of the novel. Moby Dick is a leviathan of subject matter, number of words, and awesome power. This book wasn't appreciated in Herman Melville's lifetime, but has assumed a classic status starting in the 20th century. The power of the whale and its ability to capture the imagination of the reader is well worth the work to read this book. Burned Books. Burned Books. I achieved the burning effect by using a soldering iron on a paperback novel of the co a paperback copy of the novel. The scrolls were made from paper from Nepal called Lakta. Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 is the sound fiction book, is a science fiction book and movie that had a great influence on me. Before I made this piece, I was aware that many different cultures they have tried to eradicate ideas by burning the books that they find dangerous. Little did I know that there are over 150 instances in history where book burnings have been recorded, from early civilizations to the 21st century. It is heartening to know that in spite of the determination of some people, ideas and books live on in the minds of people who have read them. Nancy Drew's Clock Since I was a young reader and had older sisters, they introduced me to Nancy Drew, and I've always loved that intrepid girl detective. When I saw this book at a used bookstore commemorating the first of the series, the idea of making the book into a functioning clock occurred to me. I did not remember the illustrations, but there they were. The Argyle pattern of the background of text and pictures reminds me of the 1930s when the series first started. Nancy Drew had her own roadster, a friend named George, 
a housekeeper, and her father, who was also a detective. I loved her spirit of independence, and that in spite of her knack for getting into trouble, she always solved the crime. Proust's Cup of Tea. In his book, The Remembrance of Things Past, Marcel Proust recognizes that the taste and smell of a Madeleine cookie dipped into a cup of tea has brought back a recollection of a time and place when he was very young. In homage to this observation, I took his book and with the help of some tea dyed text, I created a cup and saucer with two Madeleines purchased on the saucer. The tea that produced the blue text was pomegranate tea, a pale pink that turned blue when covered with matte medium, and the cookie and tea in the cup were additionally stained with tea and cinnamon. The Lighthouse and the Waves. I constructed the sculpture of the lighthouse from two parts of cardstock with the text glued on first. I made a paper pattern for the top section, but it took several tries to figure out how to make it stand for the replaceable tea light. Virginia Woolf has been credited with the invention of stream of consciousness prose. The novel To the Lighthouse is one of my favorites and I first read it in high school. In the story, a trip to a nearby lighthouse takes on significance to a household of a philosophy teacher, his family, and some guests. Nothing much happens, but everything that transpires shows the importance of thoughts, feelings, and actions that the characters display to each other and themselves. The Waves is a more poetic work with the theme of life being a series of waves, events, and people washing ashore in a chaotic pattern. A plague of rats. The rats were made out of a substance sold as paper clay that molds like clay but doesn't need to be fired. The tails were made out of wire inserted into the clay. Then all the rats were covered with the text from the plague. Dirt from the garden forms the floor. I first encountered Albert, Albert Camus, The Plague, in high school in French. Much later, I read it in English for my book group and was struck with how we are still plagued with diseases that seem to come out of nowhere. In my lifetime, there has been polio, AIDS, mad cow disease, SARS, and Ebola. In this piece, the rats are not just a cause of plague, but symbolize all those creatures that lurk in the dark, causing rack and ruin. Uncle Tom's Log Cabin Quilt Harry Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, published in 1850, was the novel that helped lay the groundwork for the Civil War. In the middle of the 19th century, log cabin quilts became a very popular pattern to home quilters in the U.S., both North and South. The light and dark colors in the pattern were suggested by skin tones of white and African American people. By using the kind of log cabin quilt pattern known as straight furrows, I chose to depict the separation of the races as a metaphor for the tragic stories told in the book, separated by color and treated entirely, entirely differently. Still, they are united in one entity. Madame Defarge's Knitting I'm a knitter. Knitting paper seemed like a challenge. It wasn't too hard as long as I folded the paper carefully first. The red nail polish worked perfectly for, bl for blood. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities is a historical novel about the French Revolution. Madame Defarge knits in the courtroom of the Revolutionary Tribunal, and her knitting secretly encodes the names of people to be killed. Her character symbolizes the bloodthirsty nature of the revolutionaries and the power they had to decide whether aristocrats lived or died. The Secret Garden Tunnel Book. I learned how to make a tunnel book in a class at the San Francisco Center for the Book, for the book from Bettina Pauly. The format seemed perfect for this rendition of the children's classic. I used the text painted with acrylic inks as the forms for the 3D flowers and trees. The Secret Garden is a novel by Francis, Francis Hodgkin Burnett. It was initially published in serial format starting in autumn of 1910 and was first published in its entirety in 1911. 
I first read this book in England when I was nine years old, The Perfect Time and Place. It is a story of the rebirth of two lonely children in a garden hidden away by tragedy. Later on in life, I read that it may have been the inspiration for D.H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover, a strange idea. Journeys, a game of life. The game board was made from images taken from History of Modern Art by H. H. Arneson. Each wooden figure was painted and then dressed in bits and pieces of found art. The dice are made from printed cardstock. The accordion fold book and poem are part of the piece and fit into a large archival box. I studied art history in college and learned much of what I know from a classic survey of modern art written by Arneson. In particular, the pictures are very instrumental in learning the figures of all the well-known Western modern greats. When I had the idea of the game, a teacher suggested that I use the images of the artist to show, to show the journeys of each character. I loved it and incorporated it in my invention. To play the game, one moves characters along the board and when you see a pile of cards, you stop and read that particular character's story. It is not a game of chance, it is simply a game of history. Thank you for watching my show. If you'd like more information, go to emilymarks, E-M-D-A-N-D-S dot com.